You're listening to a podcast of Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning, and thanks for being with us today. This is Relatively Speaking, the show all about you and your family. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. One of the most devastating events that can happen to a person is to lose a loved one to suicide. Though there's been a lot of effort over the years um, to try to prevent this sad, terrible, hopeless act, the rate of suicide has increased by 30% in the last 20 years. Not only that, but the rate has jumped again to an alarming rate during the pandemic. So, what can we do to stop losing those that we love to this hopeless act? Today, we'll talk about the warning signs of severe depression and possible suicidal thoughts and how you can take action if you see someone you care about or if it's you to do what can you do to to make a difference? How can you change things? There's truly been a great deal of attention to trying to prevent suicide. And in fact, World Suicide Prevention Day uh, was September 10th. Um, Obviously, there was so much going on during that day also. Perhaps it didn't get the attention and focus that it needed. But September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Um, In my mind, yes, let's put an emphasis on it now, but let's not forget it during the next months. How important it is uh, to share resources, stories, in an effort to shed light on, on how, what we can do, how we can help. So right before the show, I was talking to Michelle about this topic and knowing that it's kind of a downer topic, um, but What we need to do is um, focus on something positive. How can we help? What can we do? What can we do positive to help others? So, uh, Michelle, thank you for that positive note. You always are such a ray of sunshine, and I appreciate having you as as our producer for this show. Um, So let's talk a little bit about some data and why I feel like we need to just keep placing attention on this. Um, September, um, the pardon me, according to the Center for Disease Control, um, suicides is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. overall, claiming about 48 to 50,000 people every year. It's the second leading cause of death among the ages of 10 to 34, with or without COVID, okay? And um, and it's second only in, in that age group to accidental death. We have a lot. Of homicide, obviously, is up there as a cause of death. But I think we always hear about that. And we don't hear about some of the other issues that are ongoing. There were more than two and a half times as many suicides in the United States as there were homicides. We are losing a lot of very special people to suicide. Okay, so we're giving all this attention to prevention. So why is it on the rise Um, My contention, and I'd like to hear from you listeners, I contend that there's still issues that swirl around the feeling of shame and stigma that prevent people from talking openly about their troubles. Do you think that perhaps admission that you've thought about self-harm, thought about escaping from everything that's bothering you is a sign of weakness? I believe that that certainly is the case. I want to hear from you listeners, and I'm going to bring up a few more issues. Um, 
So feel free to jump in the conversation at any time. Give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Or you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. So what do you think, listeners? Um, is, is there a stigma to having a mental illness? Do you believe that some avoid treatment due to that? Or is there something more? Here's another question. Have you lost someone that you care about to suicide? I have. I can tell you it is absolutely devastating. Um, That never goes away. My other question to you is have have any of you had thoughts of self-harm? If you did, did you get help? I'd love to hear from you and hear... Um, If you reached out for help, what kind of help you got? Um, Were you able to find what you needed? And and where are you right now? So there was a survey that was done between June 24th and June 30, where um, a group of surveyors um, talked to, they reached out to 9,000 and talked to over 5,000 adults to talk to them about the mental health conditions associated with COVID-19 right now and, and looked at where people are. And there were really not any big surprises. I'm going to give you just a, a little bit of this to chew on as we're talking through the conversation. Um, so, we had we had young adults, um, younger adults, racial and ethnic minorities, essential workers, and here's another one I wanted to emphasize: unpaid adult caregivers reported having significantly worse mental health conditions um, than than um, than some others. Um, so I, I wanted you to think about that: essential workers younger adults, minorities, and unpaid adult caregivers. Now, those unpaid adult caregivers, you know who those are. Those are people who are perhaps taking care of loved ones in their home, their mothers, their fathers, who are are unable to jump in. Well, let's go on to the phones before we go any further with any of this. There is Vicki from Oxford. Hi, Vicki. Thanks so much for calling early in the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I talk to, to uh, um, go ahead. Kind of share my experience uh, and encourage others that if they are having feelings of suicide uh, or those negative thoughts about themselves, that it's okay to get help. Uh, when uh, about five years ago, Um, I was dealing with some pretty severe depression. And with your question, you were asking, was it feelings of shame that was causing people not to get help? That was one of my reasons. I was a mother of uh, three children, and I felt that if I admitted or sought out help and told people the feelings I was having, that they would think that I wasn't a good mother. I wanted to Mm. feel like I was doing everything right. And I was afraid of the stigma that it would have if I admitted that I was struggling. So I went many, many years keeping that to myself and not talking to anyone about it. So. That was, uh, and I mean, I had, you know, I had those thoughts of suicide. It had gotten that extreme. And I finally went to my doctor. And I know there are many people that don't. And I think another problem, other than the the fears of what other people are going to think, is unfortunately, you know, I'm a Christian, and there is a stigma sometimes I'm sad to say in the churches uh, right. of mental health um, and that it's that with it, you know, maybe thinking that it's not real or that it's wrong to seek out medical help. And so 
you know, we really need to, you know, our churches really need to reach out to members of their congregation and let them know that that's a place that they can go to as well. So, Vicki, that you, like you are making anybody. a wonderful point, and I think one area in which um, there could be huge leaps in people getting help is if our churches did. Uh, let people know that it was okay. Uh, Vicki, I want to ask you, would you tell us what made you finally, I am so sorry you suffered all those years, and that is uh, truly a dedicated mother who wanted to make sure that that nobody suspected that you weren't as loving and caring as you were, but that, what a big barrier. So what 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 made you move forward to get some help? internally knowing how far I had come and how close I was to to committing suicide that, that mm-hmm. I'd had so many thoughts uh, mm-hmm. about it and mm-hmm. I never did it because I never actually attempted anything because I kept thinking about my children and mm-hmm. what would happen but I still had the thoughts that a lot of mothers might have and people will think how can a lot of people say how can you think that your children would be better off without you but people that go through those types of feelings they really believe that their children will be better off without them they think that they're not good enough and without them there their children would thrive better but just through i talked to a friend Uh, I had a friend uh, that I trusted and confided in. Uh, I hadn't told anybody else, but just a very, very close Christian friend. I talked to her, and she encouraged me to talk to someone. And I went to my doctor. And thankfully, my doctor um, didn't just try to give me medicine, which I am on medicine, and it helps. She said medication is good, but that just masks the problem. You got to go to the root of the problem as well. So she sent me to a facility to get some help. So with a psychiatrist with medication on top of getting therapy and having someone to talk to on a daily and then weekly basis and the five years out, I'm thankful to say that I don't have those thoughts anymore. And they, you know, occasionally might pop up thinking, oh, I'm just messing up as a mother. But I remember where I was. And I remember the coping skills that were given to me by the doctors and the therapists. And I spent a week in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And once my family and my family were in shock. They did. They had no idea what I had been dealing with, what I've been struggling with, and they felt awful that they hadn't been there for me. But it wasn't their fault. I, I, I've, you know, I, I didn't feel like I could talk to them, but you know, they all admitted they would have been there for me. But I felt like they wouldn't understand. So right. it kind of goes both ways, you know, we, as, when we're yeah. in that, when you're that deep, and that's why I would like to say to family that, you know, if you see someone that is acting a little off, if they're not act, whether it's a child or an adult, don't just think, oh, they're just going through a little spell. Don't do that because it could be too late. Right, right. And they, you know, approach, talk to them, let them know that, it's okay if they are struggling and that they can trust you. And I do that with my children now. I have two teenagers, my children are, um, I have two teenagers and then a little one. And I, I, especially my teenagers, I make sure they know that it's normal to have fears and worries and that, It is okay to have those. It's not okay to keep it to themselves. They need to talk to somebody, and their feelings are their feelings. It's never anything to be ashamed of, and it's okay to ask. Wow, Vicki, what what wonderful. (laughs) This is just an awesome call because 
you you pointed out so very many things and what an awesome mother you are to to oh, also keep keep your kids in mind and let them know um so you pointed out to that a friend reached out to you for help a friend and noticed that yeah. something wasn't right with me mm -hmm. so that yeah. friend approached yeah. me and said is everything okay can you know do you need to talk or and nobody had actually really you know said a lot uh before that my yeah. husband suspected and he had tried to talk to me. My, I have a very loving, supportive husband. But I was even afraid to admit to him or to my parents. I just didn't want anybody. Or my children, actually, I didn't mention this. My children are adopted. And, you know, I felt, you know, if I adopted these children, I need to be able to do everything I need to do to take care of them. If I admit that I'm struggling, then I'm admitting that, I wasn't qualified to adopt them in the first place. And that was so wrong. You know, I was. Oh, going absolutely. And that's another through. confounder. Yeah. I mean, I, I see your concern because of our societal um, misplacement of and mislabeling of what this is. And obviously, um, you are a very strong person. I'm, I'm really, really impressed, Vicki. Thank you so much for your call. We need to go to our first break. We're going to take just a quick break. And we have Charlie and we also have an anonymous caller that we'll get to as soon as the break. We also are going to get to our expert, Genevieve Garrett, our social worker from K, to help us navigate through this. This is Relatively Speaking, and we'll be right back. Hey, this is Malcolm White. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Every week we talk with visual artists, musicians, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and today we're talking about suicide prevention. Suicide is far more common than it should be, um, and many times people find that they can't talk out loud about the thoughts of self-harm because of the stigma. And so we want to hear from you. We want to talk to you about what we need to do. We keep talking about preventing, but we're not doing a very good job, and we need to do a better job. So today we're going to talk about how that can happen. Join us at one eight seven seven mpb ring Give us a call at one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We're going to go straight back to the phones um we have charlie from memphis hi charlie thanks for holding and being patient hi charlie hey can you hear me yes wonderful okay good yeah i've called before i love your show and i called once about the value of, of uh, having a good counselor and a good therapist and one on the mother's day show but today um i really felt compelled uh my nephew um a few years a uh, number of years ago uh was involved in a drug-related car accident in which a lady was killed and yeah. therefore he uh, went to prison he was pretty young about 30 years old and he went to Parchman prison in Mississippi and he really had struggled there but I did not I was not around and I wa wasn't able to visit nor was his family very often and after about a year he committed suicide uh, which I'm was sorry very tragic Oh, yeah, it was very tragic uh, and sad. Uh, and so we all dealt with it in our own ways as the time went by. But it was really only a few years later when I went through my own personal struggle that I understood the depth of how you can feel when you're 
in a situation like his or others, uh, and I'm, I really believe it's different for everybody, and the former caller, hers was involved with her own stigma and her own feelings about her self-worth and her children. But for me, and I think for my nephew, I think it's a point where you just become really hopeless, and it's at the hopeless point where you feel like there's no um, answer is when you really consider the ultimate. And um, so I understand that the stigma can be very important and uh, the shame and embarrassment of whatever you're going through that leads you to feel suicidal. But like I said, I think when you reach that ultimate hopelessness is when you really consider it and when you really could do something like that. Charlie, you're absolutely right. And I'm going to pull Genevieve Garrett, um, who is a licensed social worker and at K to, to talk to us a little bit about. Genevieve, do you want to comment on, on Charlie's point? I think it's a very good one, the hopelessness that people feel. Absolutely. And thank you, first of all, for talking about this, for having this as the topic of your show. Because, and oh my gosh, your first caller hit on literally everything like uh, forget yes. expert. she she was the expert <laughs> on that because she hit on literally everything that I would have mentioned um, but also the fact that just what you're doing talking about it and just what she mentioned that um, you, talking about it herself because people often think that if we talk about it that's going to make it more likely to happen um, kind of like we think about like sex education if we talk about it then it's going to happen when actually the reverse is true right if we talk about it then right. we, then people feel more open to talk about it and just like um, she said that she that she, someone came to her and said you know can I help you what's going on and that's exactly the first recommendation that I would give if you see somebody in your life and you start to notice like your current caller said that you start to notice that, that they have that feeling of hopelessness talk to them about right. it and right. say, listen, right. I've noticed that you've been feeling really down. Um, what's happened lately? I've been feeling concerned about you. When did you begin feeling like this? You're not alone in this. I'm here for you, which exa is exactly what your callers have been saying. Just that alone made them feel like they had someone to talk to and that it was okay to talk about it. Exactly. Great points, Genevieve. Um, and, you know, I think the, the sign, sometimes people look sad and feel sad, but sometimes they're irritable or sometimes they are just withdrawn. They cancel, they cancel typical things they normally do. They stop attending a club they typically went to or they stop um, reaching out to others, right? And especially in, in children, I think we could make a point now, Genevieve, about children sometimes look very different, especially teenagers, right? Absolutely. And um, so in children, you might not see that typical, what we think of as depression, right? That sadness, that feeling of hopelessness. And exactly what you said, it comes out as irritability. And so when we're quick to um, to point out kids' faults being oppositional behavior or behavioral issues, we may want to dig a little bit deeper and see if it is actually depression because it can appear to be a behavioral issue with that irritability when, in fact, it is depression. Um, and that's exactly what I see in kids that coming across as And teaching them, and the same thing you would teach adults, to recognize what their feelings are and what the thoughts they're having are and to recognize and identify things that can reverse those thoughts and feelings and just helping them do that um, is really helpful with kiddos. Right. So the, the typical moodiness in a teenager is, is different than the irritability and severe moodiness that you might see in a teenager who's really depressed, right? Absolutely, yes. So I think what I want to make a point of is that a, a really um, a moody teenager is is someone who's in and out, but typically they're not withdrawing from their friends. They they are not stopping things that they enjoy. Um, the the severe moodiness of a depressed teen is an individual who is no longer playing soccer because they just don't feel like it anymore. Perhaps they're 
their appetites are different um, and, and the like sleep patterns change. So there are other things to keep in mind. All yes, right. And I think, um, I think it's important to, to ask those questions with teens too, because it's so easily mixed up with a moody teenager. So please ask your teens questions to get to the deeper source of it. Right. Thank you. Um, let's go to anonymous in Mississippi. Thank you for calling. Talk to us about what your thoughts are. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I wanted to give a lot of credit to Miss Vicki for her speaking on her her life and her situation and what she went through, uh, because I can relate to a lot of that. And it's a lot of mothers out there, young and old, that can relate to her situation. Uh, when I had my children, I thought I was ready for motherhood, even though my mother and my father, my mother was a perfect mother to me. But I wasn't ready mentally uh, and physically, you know, with the strength and what you need to take care of children. And so it was it was very hard. So like the things when she say you want to crawl up under a rock or you think mm -hmm. they're better off without you, that somebody else could take care of them better or those things, those thoughts come to mind. But one thing I tell my children right now, the greatest thing for anybody if you have siblings sisters and brothers that you grew up with when you come to a point in your life and you become a parent or whatever situation you have where you can pick up their phone and you're able to just pour out your heart to your sibling about what you have going on that's one of the greatest comforts and then uh, my other thing is um also knowing the fact that god is a god of comfort he knows what we're going through, and sometimes if we don't have anybody, we may not have sisters, brothers, or family to reach out, but God is always there. He's a God of comfort, and he listens to our prayer. That's what I wanted to share. Well, that's beautiful, and that's very reassuring, and I, I do think that that um, we've had two mothers all about about their children and their dedication to their children and some I wonder you know looking at protective factors if knowing that your children need you there I, I want this as a reminder I know sometimes um, you think that perhaps your children would be better off without you but if you think about the devastation that suicide causes, it, it just does not make sense. And knowing that, sometimes when you're in the depths of depression, your thoughts don't make sense. And that's why you need to reach out to others to, to give you the help so that, that you are not trapped in trying to save yourself because sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's very hard. Thank you for that call so much. Well, I'm going to stay on the phone lines. Let's go to Bruce from Picayune. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for calling. Good morning. How you doing, Doctor? I'm doing well. Thank you, Bruce. I, uh, I've been one. I've struggled with depression literally my entire life. I remember I wound up in and out of counseling from the time I was eight or nine years old because... At the time, my mother was able to tell that something was not right with me. But I, over time, got better at hiding it because I didn't want to be one who was having to go and deal with things. I just wanted to kind of ignore it and pretend it would go away. And I got real bad off when I was in high school. And I got to a point where I was, I was real close to the edge there. But what actually happened was a friend of mine who I have been real close to since junior high actually did wind up taking her own life. And seeing how that just rocked not only her family and our friend group, but really our entire community just kind of grabbed me up by the back of the neck and let me see that this was much more impactful than on just myself or my immediate circle. And it, it really shook me. And she was one, she had been in and out of treatment herself for a few years. She had, uh, she had stopped taking the medication that was prescribed to her and it wasn't caught in time. But I, uh, I went on for a few years just kind of self-medicating with various coping mechanisms 
until mm-hmm. I uh, I started dating the young woman who wound up being my wife, and she was just like, look, I love you, I want to be with you, but something's got to give, and she got me in a good treatment program, and it's been some ups and downs, and at one point I even spent a, a week inpatient, but over the last few years, I've found a cocktail that works for me. I've found some doctors who are real good for me and I'm in a better place than I've ever been in my life. Wow. What a, Bruce, congratulations on being able to get through this. And and um, you've brought up several points that I know Genevieve and I both wanted to cover. Um, one, like several others, you you've noted that having someone who reaches out and says that that you need you need to get some help and you need to get the right kind of help is all important so um, if anyone out there is afraid that there is perhaps someone spiraling in depression and needs help say it to them reach out take their hand tell them that you've noticed something's not right Um, the, the other thing that you noted, and this is so common, the substance abuse piece. Uh, many times people who struggle with mood disorders um, often will turn to substance abuse, which we all know that's not the right direction, but it's one of those things that happen. So if you have a friend who is struggling with substance abuse, it likely means that there is some sort of anxiety or depression going on that they're trying to mask. And and then the other thing that I wanted to point out, and Genevieve, I, I think you and I both see this all the time. Many times when, when depression and anxiety starts at a very young age, uh, one thing that we know is that there is definitely some genetic tendency toward um, mood disorders. So if you had a parent or a grandparent who struggled with mood disorders, often it will also present in you. It's There's some genetic tendency, there's some neurochemical issues. And um, Genevieve, you might want to comment on this. I know as we take family histories, often parents say, yes, I struggled with this and I see it in my child, right? Absolutely. And that, so that when we do a really good history, when we see a child come in, we always ask about family history. And when we talk about anxiety or depression, um, the parent will say, that was me as a kid. And so um, there's a strong genetic component, too. And another topic that he brought up was he mentioned that he had a friend um, who had um, committed suicide. Um, and yes. actually we know there's research that shows that this can happen in clusters and we don't know why exactly it happens in clusters. There's a lot of theories about that, but one of the reasons is that experiencing the death, especially the traumatic death of a friend is actually a trauma and trauma is a risk factor for depression. So if we're going through this trauma and it's almost as he explained a community trauma, more kids in that community are going to be, have experienced that trauma and it's going to make them more prone to depression and which is a risk factor for suicide. Right. Thank you, Bruce, for your call. You made, you, you made several awesome points and I'm so glad you're doing well. Thank you so much. Okay. We are going to go take a very quick break. And when we come back, we have Lee from Yazoo who Lee hang with us. You've been patient waiting. We have some open lines though. Give us a call. If you want to join in, we really appreciate the conversation. I think it's helpful to others. Give us a call at 1877 MPB ring that's 877-672-7464 you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org this is relatively speaking i'm dr susan buttress we'll be right back Dr. Susan Buttress. Parents are a child's first teacher. 
Children make connections to the growing world around them through back and forth interactions. Parents and other caregivers can help children learn communication and social emotional skills by talking, reading, and singing each day. More information at MississippiThrive.com. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back and thanks for listening. Today we're talking about suicide, suicidal ideation, um, how it's important to talk about it. Let everybody know if there are any thoughts. You reach out if there's someone that you care about who you think has signs of significant depression or anxiety even, and perhaps withdrawing. We're going to go back to the phones. We've had some awesome callers, so I want to stay right here. Lee has been patient from Yazoo. Hi, Lee. Thanks for calling. Howdy. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. So just jump right in, okay? Um, I yeah, listening, jump in. <laughs> listening, listening to the show this morning, I mean, I'm just driving through Yazoo City. I'm, I live up around Tupelo, but it uh-huh. it struck me that I've gone through bouts of of uh, a little not really depression, but there's a uh, there's a group of people out there that I don't think are getting uh, enough looked at. It's the empathetic people. Uh, I'm strongly an empathetic person. I, I fall at movies that are sad. Can't watch a dog's purpose without crying after the whole movie. Uh, can't even <laughs> think about things like that. And there's a group of us. I mean. I have thoughts of suicide all the time simply because it's a horrible world I'm living in. And I, it's just, mm-hmm. People are horrible to each other. I think John Coffey said it best on the Green Mile. People are just being ugly, and I'm tired, boss. You know, and yeah. sometimes the only thing that keeps you going is like uh, my mother would kill me if I killed myself, or basically it would be <laughs> my mother would die if I were to kill myself. It would just be too much stress on her. So, you know, I would never actually do it. But you think about these things because mm-hmm. empathetic people feel everything around them. So one thing mm-hmm. to look for in your friends and in, in your relatives, uh, if they cry a lot at movies, if they really feel strongly about, say, an abused dog post on Facebook or a, a child gone missing, watch those people because they are the ones who feel the pain of the world the most and would most like to leave that pain behind. I don't know if you can understand that, if that makes any sense. Lee, it makes perfect sense, and and I think you're right. Um, it's individuals who have that amygdala, that that part of the brain that is sensitive and caring and and um, more emotional. Uh, it probably does put you at at stronger risk. Um, as far as I know, I need to look into that. As far as the empathy factor, if those individuals are more likely. Um, Genevieve, do you have a comment on that? I think Lee's point is a good one. Yeah, I could, I could, I could actually relate to that. Yeah, definitely, for people that feel bigger, like you're going to be more aware of all the things going on, and you're going to kind of take it on, right? So um, we kind of have to be that, careful about that as therapists, right? Because we hear. Um, we hear people talking about how they feel all the time. Um, so we have to be really good at self care. Um, so I can see how a person that is very empathetic would take on a lot of other problems, um, and have to think about self care a lot more. Absolutely. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great point. And there, there is, you know, there's been the bystander post-traumatic stress disorder that's recently been described in the literature from first responders, from uh, therapists who are dealing, um, trying to help people through their stressors and they start feeling so much stress that it begins to cause mental behavioral health for issues for them. So, um, Lee, thanks for calling in on that. That's a a really great thing we need to remember. If you're one of those deep feelers, it doesn't necessarily mean that something horrible had to happen to you for you to feel the depths of of what some feel as far as depression and hopelessness. Exactly. That was was the point I was hoping to get across because it's not always something that has happened or you're not always depressed. Sometimes you just feel the weight of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Lee, thanks for calling. Thank you. Well, let's stay on. Okay. Let's stay on the phone. Um, we have Zach next. I'm not sure where Zach's from. Hi, Zach. Thanks for calling. Okay. I'm down in Gulfport this morning. Oh, good. All right. Tell us what your thoughts are. Well, it's uh, all of the things you've mentioned so far, the family history, the substance abuse. Uh, those are the two things that struck me the most. Uh, my mother committed suicide and uh, she was an alcoholic. And I was an alcoholic, and I didn't realize I was depressed, but I didn't realize how much of a role that played. And I kind of set about to kill myself through drinking, and I called my sister when I was pretty deep in the DTs, and she said, hey, look, go to the hospital. So I did, and they sent me to the ICU, and you know, I made it. But right after that, I went to rehab, and um, it completely changed my life. I didn't realize how much of a factor – the substance abuse was in the depression mm -hmm. and now my problems are so much more manageable and so I just really want to urge anybody who's struggling with those thoughts and has a substance abuse problem to take care of that first and it the world just gets better immediately um, and that's well, what a yeah, great a message that's a lot, Zach. That's not a little. That's a, a great message for others to listen to. And and yes, the the alcoholism is we know also highly genetically based. The the prone nest to having that and and you're absolutely right that if you don't deal with the substance abuse you can't deal with any kind of mood disorder or other issue so i i don't think either genevieve or i could have said that message better um genevieve you have any additional comment for zach absolutely that was a wonderful message and i think sometimes um people turn to alcohol and other substances to self-medicate when we're feeling, um, when we have that feeling of depression or other things. Um, and it doesn't make the problem any better, but it masks it for a while, right? And I'm so happy that Zach was able to reach out to someone and get help. That's an amazing story. All right. Have a great day. And, you know, I do want to make a, a, another real quick point before we get to our next caller. And that is a couple of people have mentioned, actually three, have mentioned um, being hospitalized for maybe a short period of time. Sometimes that's necessary to just protect you, to, to get you started on the right road and then be out. You know, long-term institutionalization is typically not recommended anymore, but good outpatient support is what what we hope for now, making sure that, that you get those protective factors around you to take care of you. All right, we have Kenny on the road. Kenny, are you still there for us? I'm still here. Uh, was Great. Driving uh, left out of the Gulfport area and driving up to – the Dallas area. I'm a Methodist minister in the Dallas area, and um, I uh, had a sermon series on depression and suicide a few years ago after Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade committed suicide, mm -hmm. and it was sort of in the news. And <clears throat> I just wanted to talk about, you know, again, the first caller, I believe, Vicki, you know, hit a lot of nails on the head. But, um, you know, you talked about, you know, the shame part where people somehow think that, you know, you're not... Um, uh, mentally strong enough if you have depression or consider or complete suicide but also some people think that their faith isn't strong enough and so there's that double whammy and even a guilt that if they're considering that well that means they're not you know if they say if they're persons of faith that their faith is lacking and really nothing could be farther from the truth and in my sermon series i used uh psalm 22 uh, which is the song Jesus referred to, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you look at that entire psalm, it is really someone, the psalmist, who we would probably diagnose as being very depressed, if not, and I, the way I read it, uh, expressing suicidal ideology, ideation. And, you know, so if, if you know, Scripture contains 
from a psalmist, and indeed Jesus himself quoted that on the cross, than uh, of someone who was depressed and even having today what we might consider suicidal thoughts. Um, you know, certainly it is a valid uh, area of care that the church should be providing and caring for and, and not, uh, you know, pronouncing shame or, or judging people that their faith is not strong enough. Um, you know, so uh, the other thing I was going to say, um, it, it relates to how people can say, well, how could somebody kill themselves that had so much to live for? Well, that's the reality, but when you go through depression, either a traumatic depressive experience or long term, you know, their concept of reality changes. You know, for what is reality for them, you know, is different than what is the actual reality. And, and the, the um, illustration I used was if you take a picture of something and apply filters and change the light and other things, it can look ex extremely different than the actual picture. And the image I used for that series, it looked like um, it was an image looking up out from the bottom of a well. It was very dark and stony mm -hmm. and really not a pretty image. But then when I showed the true image, it was looking from the floor through the top of a church, and it was white and it was gorgeous, but just with a few changes, um, uh, uh, on filters, it looked vastly different, and that's what depression can do uh, to someone's perception of reality. Yeah, great, great points. I think that you made, and and I, I'm so happy that you have done a sermon on this, and I hope that you will do it regularly because this, if we could. Uh, if we could have, like I said, uh, our, our South is full of many churches. If we could have our ministers, preachers, priests, all talking about this and letting people know it's okay to reach out for help, and it's not a sign of lack of faith or lack of uh, ability or lack of love, then um, all would be better off. So thank you so much for that, that call. Um, I know, uh, Genevieve, we only have a couple of minutes, I think maybe a minute and a half left. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, just quickly any last points of uh, what what we should be doing and how we should reach out? I just just the, the fact that we're talking about it and just want to reemphasize again, don't be afraid to talk about it. Make it a regular conversation about feelings with kids. You know, start at day one, giving them that language to talk about how they feel. And one of the callers said, I think when she talks to her kids, saying that all feelings are okay, but keeping it to yourself is not what we want to do. We want to encourage kids from a young age to talk about feelings so that we become adults that are willing to talk about our feelings with others and to just reach out. If you notice any differences in your kid, teenager, friend, sister, brother, parent, um, cause we don't want to forget about um, mm. our um, senior citizens. That's a huge right. um, population that we worry about. And, um, and so reach out to people and just ask questions. Right. There's some great hotlines. We will have those on our uh, Facebook page, uh, Michelle, if we can do that, that would be wonderful. There, there, there's help out there. So I want to thank um, all of our callers. I want to thank everyone. Please listen to this podcast. If you got in on just part of it, download your favorite podcast um, uh, app. I want to thank Genevieve Garrett, too. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking, and stay tuned for NPR's here and now, coming up next.